We are here today learning at the Surfside Kolel Boker, the book Migdash Me'at Ben Omar Amen, how to behave in the synagogue, in shul. It's an unbelievable sefer, um, very interesting, it's unfiltered, it's very explicit, it's going to say things you may not want to hear. If you're not from the faint-hearted, uh, you might not want to listen in. But the book also gives you a lot of benefit of how to behave in shul, what are the berachot that come with it. Okay. We're reading on page 33. Be worthy of being in the abode of Melech HaMashiach, the Mashiach. Be worthy of the world to come. Number four. Mashiach Sidkenu also receives elevation when we answer Amen Yeheshem And therefore, he anticipates this. Undoubtedly, this will also benefit us in the future when we will be able to sit in the abode of the Mashiach and learn Torah from him. Something which not everybody is worthy of doing. Shomer Munim, part two, page 257. Number five. The Holy Tanah, Rabbi Meir Baal Hanes, therefore said, that a child is worthy to enter the world to come from the time that he answered Amen. Why? Because a baby enters the world like a golem without a spiritual form. And he cannot be worthy of the light of the world to come until he has a levush, a garment. Like it says in the Holy Zohar, Bereshit 7, Lech uh, Lecha 91 and Teruma 101. That without the levush it is impossible to enter the Garden of Eden, Gan Eden. If the child enters Amen, he acquires a form and a levush. The greatness of answering Amen is that without any knowledge or warning, this child acquires the levush, the shene yedin, the fine Jews. I guess that's a Yiddish word, shene yedin. The fine Jews are causing most of the public to converse during Hazarat Hashas and Kaddish, which causes suffering and delays the Geula, the final redemption. He brings in something down. This is Ham Musafi talks about this also, that a child gets his chelik in olam haba the moment that he reaches a point that says amen. The moment that that child says that, he gets that, his portion done. Of course, there's things with children that are under, that don't have the ability to say, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a normal situation, a normal child growing up, the moment that he has the ability to answer amen, and he does, that's the ticket. He got his, uh, uh, you know, admit one to Gan Eden, uh, to his portion. Number six, in the Sefer Hagon, it states that it was revealed to him from heaven, and so too it was revealed to Rabbi Yaive from Austria that this is delaying the Geula, the redemption. Therefore, my beloved brothers, have pity on your souls and be very conscientious with this. Then you will be greatly rewarded because this is considered a met mitzvah, a dead body that has no one to occupy himself with the burial. Whoever transgresses this cannot be considered one of my pupils, because I always went to great pains in my Bet Midrash, where I was able to admonish, and in my neighbor's Bet Midrash, where I was able to take action to uphold this mitzvah. In other synagogues, I was hep- helpless, because they emulate these so-called Shene Yidin, who calls the fine Jews, who converse during prayers. He means fine, not in their acts. They make themselves like they're fine in the way that they dress, in the way that they drive, but they're not fine in the, in the way that they're conversing the prayer, but they consider themselves in that way. It is only the one who wants to guard his soul from falling into Gehinam, and Medora Tata'a, in the words of the Holy Zohar, who will not speak during Chazalat Hashats, Kaddish, Keriyat Torah, etc. If the evil inclination will try to persuade you that you will cause you, cause you to lose money, in reality, no one ever lost money from upholding Kavod Shamayim, the honor of heaven. Like it says, Dorshe Hashem, Lo Yachseru, Chol Tov, those who seek Hashem lack nothing. Okay. He's trying to tell you is that if you think that by not talking in shul, you're going to lose out on a deal or lose out on something. He says it's nothing. It's a, that's nonsense and it's, it's, it's nothing. That's no truth to it. Uh, number seven. I've heard told by the Gaon HaKadosh, the Baal Imre'esh Zatzal, that he once had a disciple who conversed during Hazarat Hashatz. All that day he called this person Gadol. Interesting. So the Baal Imre'esh he had a, a guy in the shul, he was talking during the shul, so he called him a gadol. He referred to him as a big person, the great one. His other, student, his other students asked him the reason why this particular student was being honored with such status. Rabbi, why are you calling him a gadol? He said he answered, because when he spoke during Chazar HaShatz today in the morning, he committed a great sin, like it says in the Shulchan Aruch, Or Hayim 124-7, and therefore I call them the Great One. Shomer Munim, page 252. It says in the Shulchan Aruch that someone who talks during the Hazara is gadol avono mineso. It, that his sin is heavier than he can carry. 
So the rabbi was making fun of the student. He said he was talking during the, the, the Hazar Dashat, so I called him a gadol. You think I'm calling him a gadol because he's a gadol like you think of the gadolim. No, this is a gadol avonom in his He goes, this guy, he's a gadol in the sins that he's carrying. Unbelievable. Page 35, number 8. Most of the time, if one is approached by a prominent person who wishes to speak to him, he's ashamed to say, to say now is Hazrat Hashas or Kaddish, so go away, I cannot speak to you. Because he will be called the Batlan and a frumer shote, an over-religious fool. Regarding this, it states, He tells you that be strong. When there's going to be situations where someone's going to come to you, your kids, your friend, hey, how are you? I saw a friend here I didn't see here in 10 years this morning. My friend Mark, I didn't see him in 10 years. And I know him from Brooklyn, we're good buddies, and he hugged me. But he was trying to talk to me and I shut him up right on the moment. I told him right away, no talking. He knew right away, he knew that I wasn't kidding around. And then when we were done, tefillah, we sat there for 20 minutes. We sat, we talked, we had breakfast together, great. I don't have to have that conversation in the tefillah. No one has to have that conversation. It's not, there's no purpose to it. And we, we force ourselves to say like silly things because like we think it's important, it's not. You know, that's why I tell people when you're sitting in shul, don't sit next to your friend. Sitting next to your friend is going to cause you to talk to him. It's just normal, by the way. You know, you have a good buddy next to you. Hey, you heard, you heard what happened. You did this. He says, avoid the situation. The same way we would tell someone who wants to have Shemina Tenayim, don't go to the beach. We tell someone who doesn't want, wants to have Shemina Lashon in the shul, don't sit next to your friend. You know, we're not, you know, I don't think in the Beit HaMikdash they were talking. And if they were, that probably was the cause of the destruction. But, you know, you have to be careful. Be strong and courageous because there is no reason for you to be embarrassed or, and cowardly. Strengthen your heart and you should not fear any man and you should not be ashamed but fulfill the directives of the Shulchan Aruch to rebuke him no matter who he is, especially if he is who talks during prayers in public. So he says another thing. Some people do this bitsinah, they whisper quietly, you don't even know that he did it. That was something that like, the guy is invisible. He spoke but that wasn't, didn't affect anyone. Then you have the guy who's talking and he can't keep his mouth shut. This is the guy that you're in shul and he's loud. Like you hear him, it's annoying. It's annoying to everybody. Even to the guy who talks during the tefillah. Even he says that's annoying. Like it got out of hand. So he says, you know, it's okay. You can, you can call him out on it. Um, if, he, if one stops others from talking and thereby causes people to answer amen. Let's say you came and told the guy, like, shh or whatever, you said it in a way that was appropriate in the context. Because even though I don't talk in shul, I generally don't tell other people unless it's my minyan. Meaning I have run my own minyanim, let's say on the high holidays or certain places, I have rules in my minyanim. If it's not my minyan, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not in charge, so I'm not going to tell them anything. But he says the person who does do this, and, and let's say everyone became quiet, and now instead of 10 people answering amen, you had 30 people answering amen because they said it right. He obtains the merits of everybody in the public. He takes the zikhut of everybody. When they get into the Shamaim, everyone's getting a gift, they're throwing this guy a coin. Meaning everyone, Matana, Matana, he's getting one equal to them. Why? What did he do? Because he, he caused the other people to answer Amen. Uh -huh. By shutting up the person who was talking in Shul. But that, of course, I told you, I don't do that. Uh, only it's, if it's my Minyan. If it's my Minyan, I'll do it. I'm not going to walk into other people's Shuls and, sh and shush them. That's not my place. But in my own Minyan, I will. Now, in this book, by the way, he tells you it is your place. But this Minyan, he's very clear. He tells you, yeah, it's your place and you can do it anywhere. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, again, this is unfiltered. You know, you take it for whatever it is. You know, I'm just teaching it and then you can do whatever you want with the knowledge. He obtains the merit of the public. Even if you see a holy man, a Sadiq, talking during Chazarat Hashats, God forbid that you should follow his example. You might say he's a Sadiq. He might be a Sadiq, but he could still be a Sadiq and talk during Chazarat. Even if Eliyahu and Navi, the prophet, would come, Zakhulatov. He is not to be obeyed if he wishes to obliterate one of the Gemara or the Shulchan Aruch or these frightening warnings. I mean, if Eliyahu and Navi Zakhulatov walks in tomorrow morning during the Tefillah and starts talking during the Hazara, we shush Eliyahu and Navi also. We tell them uh, Hila. You can't change the Shulchan Aruch, even though you're Eliyahu and Navi Zakhulatov. Please, uh, no talking. It's unbelievable. Uh, even if you are conscientious, you will receive the reward that would have been given to the whole world had they followed this prohibition. And in addition, the merit that others are learning from your behavior. Okay, listen, this is unfiltered. You know, I told you, Ezra, this was no joke, this book. We found this book in the shul. I don't even know who it belongs to. There's no author's name on it. It just tells you things about how to behave in shul, how to, not, how to answer. We'll read one, one or two more, and then we'll end this today's portion. I regularly chastise people 
who pray while the Hazan is reviewing the Shimonis and the Amidah because their prayers will surely not be granted them and whatever they already have, have will be taken from them. Whoa! That's tough. He says he chastises people who are praying during the Hazara Tashats. Why? He says because if you're praying during Hazara, you can't, you're not listening to the Hazan. And if you're not listening, then who is he talking to? Yeah, when he's saying the Berachot, who is he saying that to? Is he, meaning, if everyone there is in a different world, in a different zone, you're answering Amen, but it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like Siri answering Amen. You, I bet they could train Siri today, if that you said the Amidah, it would answer Amen. What was the difference? None, both of them have their mind in a completely different place. Uh, you know, it's crazy. Okay, because their prayers will should not be granted. He says, not only would the prayers not get granted, he says, Has shalom, things could be taken away. All the rabbis say that when the Hazan reviews the Shemunah, said the public must be quiet, answer Amen, and concentrate on the Berachot. Sefer Vavya Amudim, end of chapter 10, Magin Abraham, Siman 124. Number 10, the hardest thing is that those so called Shene Yidin, he calls them the fine Jews, they're really not fine, he's making fun of them, are not conscientious to answer Amen, Yehe Shemei Rabbah. They are causing a Hilul Hashem, a desecration of Hashem's name. For those who see that the greater ones are careless, and for those simple people who have no one to teach them to do this, this is a terrible Hilul Hashem, besides the fact that it causes others to sin and prevents them from receiving their share in the world to come. This is, uh, this is rough, but I told you, listen, we, uh, we wanted to teach in a unique way, bring out the basics. It's not rough. It's basic, but you know what? Uh, you don't really see people talking about this publicly, so I figured we, we found this book, and by the way, I'll tell you, I, I don't even know where this book came from. I'm not kidding. Like, I go through the Sfarim, I found this in Hechal Shalom. I was going through the Sfarim in Hechal Shalom, and then I found it in there, and I looked it up. There's no title, uh, no, no, um, no author's name no, on that. It's an unbelievable book. I read it. I couldn't believe how many sources. The whole book is 240 pages of just sources. So we're learning it, and uh, hopefully, the whole purpose of this is one thing. Don't talk in shul. Answer Amen. Answer Amen. Yehe Shemei Rabbah. Kedusha. And, and, and Hazarat Hashat. He's telling you in short that all the problems a person has is because he misbehaves in shul. He says if you fix that, most of the blessing will come in your life. Did you talk about what's the real reason why they're not allowed to speak while they pray? Uh, he didn't go into it yet, but in the book he does talk about the uh, esoteric Kabbalah stuff. He's coming into it. Yeah, but he's going to... Yeah. That says that when you speak, look what he says. It's it's the most profound thing I ever heard. It says that while you, if you if you think or speak while you're praying, it's the same thing as if you took uh, um, uh, a spy and brought it into Beit Hamikdash. You have that. You have that sefer. You can bring it you tomorrow. You have, that, exactly. you have that sefer? You yeah. can bring it? Yeah. Can you bring it tomorrow? Let's, let's, let's quote that in there. All right, and then we'll end this recording. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen.